Welcome to Creatively Christian, a podcast by Theophany Media, where we inspire, inform, educate, and empower creative Christians of all types. I'm one of your hosts, Brandon Hollingsworth. Today, Lynn Baber interviews Brandon Hollingsworth and three of his friends about their publishing company, Four Fools Press. They discuss how to create in collaboration and make stories that reflect God's truth. Hi, I'm Lynn Baber, your host today, and welcome to Creatively Christian Podcast. And I'm excited, and I have to say I have a bit of trepidation today because I have the privilege, I think, of interviewing the four fools. Now, before we go further, I just want to tell you that these are members of the Four Fools Press, four gentlemen who have been writing and doing other creative collaboration for seven years. So today I am happy to welcome Brandon Hall. There you go, just raise those hands. Um, Just in case this comes through, uh, Brandon Hollingsworth. Hello. Davis Riddle. Hi. And Corey Blankenship. Hi there. So if you're listening to the audio of this, there's gonna be four guys and me. And if you don't get confused by who's who, you know, don't feel like you're the odd man out. (laughs) We'll just go from here. And gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us on. Yeah. So if you could just tell us quickly, because I know y'all collaborate in published products, but how did you get together? And of course, one of the big things that we're really interested in is, is how that, you know, where the faith component was in this. Sure, sure. So that, that's, a, that's a loaded question, Lynn, uh, because for instance, uh, this gentleman to my right here, Davis, we have been friends since the 10th grade in high school and uh, pretty much every uh, creative endeavor I've been involved in, he's been involved in some manner uh, or another. Uh, Brandon Hall behind me, uh, who we, we affectionately refer to as Hall. He and I have the same first name. Um, we met, uh, we were college roommates. And so uh, we've been involved in all sorts of creative endeavors as well. And then Corey over here, who is the youngest member of our group uh, and by far the handsomest. Um, uh, he and my son were actually good friends in high school. And uh, he is a writer and a theologian and he has his own checkered past as well. And so I pulled him into kind of this creative cyclone that is my creative existence. And so we've been involved in more than four fools and uh, we're happy to talk about all those today. Well, I think something that, you know, for me as an author and I think hopefully for our audience, you know, the idea of working in collaboration with other people can seem very, very daunting and like the first step down the wrong road. (laughs) So, you know, you, you say in your website that you kind of differentiate between the roles. And I've noticed that in the different books that you've published as Four Fools Press over the last seven years, that it's not always the same authors listed under each project. So when you guys put collaboration together, you know, what can you share with our audience about you know, the wonderful parts of it, the sticky parts of it, and how it might be beneficial to other people who are considering publishing. I think uh, if you think about it, it's an awful lot like a performance group, like a rock group, right? You have, you have performers that have different talents and different abilities, right? You have musicians who would play guitar or a drum, somebody who's a vocalist, right? Well, that's one of the things we do. We have different viewpoints and, and not in different viewpoints, but different passions and different different energies, mm-hmm. right? So I, I really love historical context and I really love getting into the nature of, of how something would have happened, how, what would have been the right way it to happen. Uh, Brandon Hall is very much into the heart. He, get, he brings a very emotional, a very uh, stirring feel to it. You get characters and, and situations where you start really feeling for them, right? And uh, of course, Brandon Hollingsworth is, He's chaos embodied, but <laughs> yeah. he's the one that allows that spark. You know, you can't have an engine running without having some sort of spark that gets it going, right? That's the, the, the impetus to the, to the big fire. And then we got Corey, who's got, his experiences are very worldly. 
I mean, he's been he's been hiking in, in Ireland. He's he almost became a space marine, you know. And these yeah. are all things <laughs> that bring it together. And so as as a result, oftentimes we'll have argument on how something should be done. But when it comes down to it, we bring all our different viewpoints mm -hmm. and whatever project that might be. Some of us will work on it. Some of us won't, depending on if that sits within what we're, you know, what we kind of go with. Yeah. And I think another thing that Corey really brings as well is he, he helps keep us on our theological rails. He's so, very, ha very high on apologetics. So, so, and Corey's degree is in, is in intercultural studies. So it's the Bible applied to different cultures and how those interact. Right. And so he helps really keep us always making sure that we're checking our crazy ideas against scripture, against the truth of what God's word says. Um, we're all believers. We all love Jesus. We all worship together. We all mm -hmm. pray together. And that's, that's a big part of it as well, Lynn, is that any project that we're going into, you know, we're seeking God's will for that project, whatever it's going to be. Uh, even if there are unbelievers involved and we've got some stuff that we've got, you know, people who don't believe in Jesus that are involved in the project, but as a core group, we always want to keep that as our center mm -hmm. and as our ultimate goal is, uh, is that, that theological pinpointing this. Well, you know, I have looked at the list of books you've published. <laughs> Russian eight men from space. Hey, <laughs> I, I, I hope the, the listeners can hear that, but that was Russian ape men in space. Yeah, perfectly absolutely. normal. And just, just for giggles. Sure. How did you weave a scriptural story into Russian ape men in space? Yeah, there's a, there's a huge spiritual component in that, in that the, 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 the crux of that story is all about loving your, your family, right? That's what the main component of that entire story is. And although our main characters are Russian ape men, and they just happen to be in a time capsule, you know, frozen in space, and they've journeyed to hollow earth in order to battle Cthulian monsters. It's really when you boil it down, those characters are, they're struggling to keep their, their beloved, you know, wives uh, and countrymen alive in the midst of all this challenge and danger. And, you know, that's just one of the many examples of the ways that we like to take, you know, what are essentially foundational, spiritual, you know, biblical truths and just kind of hang some different trappings on them so that they appeal to a different audience. Mm -hmm. So it's not as hard as you might think. Well, since Brandon, you're another host of the podcast here, so you know that I only write nonfiction. So right. <laughs> you know, what, what you guys do is such a stretch, but so, so listeners, it doesn't matter what it is that you do or write. If this group can pair theology with, Okay, so we have Russian ape men in space. What are a couple of the other character groups that you have shared with your readers? Okay, well, Davis, you want to talk about a couple of your Four Fools books? Well, one of them um, has been, you know, in Ephesians, it talks about we don't just stand against this world, but against the princely, the dark powers out there. And so we are in, as, as believers, very much in a spiritual warfare. Now we do have we do have our warrior. We have Jesus Christ, and he's our Captain America who goes there and he's got the shield, right? And we are the minions running around on, on you know on the on the city streets trying to avoid the the big baddies. But we will often explore. Like a, a good example would have been um, Angels Glow, which is actually an historical fiction, which which intertwines the reality of something they had called the Angels Glow with the spiritual warfare element of, of, well, baptism and your marking that is seen by, by the spiritual world. I mean, quite literally, while as believers, we're marked. And while, while the heavenly hosts see us and rejoice, you got the dark hosts that see us and target us, right? Mm -hmm. And as, as a believer, that becomes something we really have to struggle with. And so we can really go down that road and, and look at historical events in this case it was the battle of shiloh uh, during the civil war which was up to that point one of the bloodiest ever and then apply that 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 spiritual element not only was it man against man but there was spiritual darkness involved and and then playing off that and and what ifs um another one we did was um in the in a similar vein dealing with spooks right 
you know, ghosts. what we would consider uh, ghosts, what? right? Spooks or ghosts, right? Spooks, uh, okay, right. dealing with yeah. spooks you know, and ghosts, and, all right. But looking at it from a, from a side view, you know, from the, the, the believer who is doing the haunting, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. And we, we even had, you know, folks who aren't believers that are, that are involved with the group um, who are writing their own kind of stories and their own ideas. And after being friends with them for a while, they actually begin inserting characters that represent maybe a view that is opposite their main character. So, uh, for instance, uh, we've got a guy whose name is Ralston Hunsinger. He's a fantastic artist, but he's a very outspoken pagan. We love him to death. He's one of our brothers, but he's not a believer. And he writes a series um, uh, of Ehrlich's tales that we published at Four Fools Press. And he actually created a character called Palladius, who is uh, essentially a, a prototype for a Christian. He's a, he's a Roman. Um, who plays foil to a pagan uh, Viking, which is the main character. And he says, you know, plainly, he says, that's you, Brandon. He says, that character is you, because every time we get together, you won't leave me alone about this Jesus stuff. <laughs> and so he wrote that character into the story, and it makes the story so much richer, and it gives an opportunity to have a talking point. And I think that's really the, the main thing. If we can cause people to have conversation and cause people to ask questions, um, then I think we're doing our job. Mm -hmm. How has that worked for you? Um, in what other circumstances? I mean, y'all are very creative. I don't know why you call yourself schools, but I think somebody's going to tell me soon. Um, <laughs> and once you do that, you know, what are some of the comments? What are the opportunities you've had or how you've seen that intention actually play out? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. We've had opportunities in the past when we would go to conventions, uh, you know, uh, where we're marketing our books, you know, anybody that's gone to these uh, big conventions where we might do panels very similar to this podcast. And, and we take a whole different, you know, approach to a panel. A lot of times you go to these panels and everyone is sitting up on the stage behind the, the table with the white, you know, the tablecloth with their glasses of water and they're kind of almost preaching from the dais, you know, they're preaching from on high. And uh, we said, you know what, we're, we're no different than anybody else here. We're just gonna go, we're gonna take the chairs, we're gonna sit down right in the floor in front of you. We're just gonna have a conversation. And, and we just really feel like letting people know that we're nothing special. The only reason we're special is because of what Jesus has done in our lives, you know, because of his grace. That's the only thing that sets us apart. He gave us the gifts that we have and so, you know, just, just the way we try to act, I think, is, is the, the opportunity. And really, that's what all believers are supposed to do. We're supposed to be in the world, but so different that people go, what's, what's wrong with y'all? Y'all are weird and different. I want to know more. And we kind of live that out pretty easily. We had a, a, a really great moment one time at a, at a huge convention that had people from Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica and all these well-known names. And they had all been doing these panels. And one thing that we were that's really important is, you know, a lot of Christians apologize for being Christian. We apologize for our faith. Right. And that's one thing that I've really enjoyed about this group is that we don't have to. In fact, we won't. You know, I look at Paul or really better yet, John the Baptist and say, oh, yeah, that's who I want to be like. And we had this one convention we were at where we decided to do a pickup game. And we had a, we got a bunch of Christian authors at a science fiction fantasy convention and decided to do C.S. Lewis and on being a Christian author. And it ended up being the largest single panel yeah. of the whole convention. We had easily over 100 people came in just to hear his talk. Mm -hmm. And it was all about uh, unapologetically writing as a Christian. Sometimes you write Christian fiction. Sometimes you write fiction that's written by a Christian, you know, where you are, you're, you're very much for the Lord, but it, it's just a story. But in any case, it was so it was so powerful to watch how the Lord worked mm -hmm. because we were quite literally as close to being in Gomorrah sometimes as you can be sure. and unapologetically said, we're Christian. This is who we are. And everybody showed up. Yeah. And we have people come up to us afterwards and thank us yeah. and say, mm -hmm. Hey, I've never, I've never met a Christian like you before. You know, I didn't even know Christians like science fiction or I didn't know Christians were into comics sure. or yeah. gaming. And so they were like, that's, that's so cool. And so it, it really does. It kind of creates an opportunity to talk to somebody that you might not ever be able to talk to otherwise. So. And that's, that's an interesting um, observation that, you know, when you're on our side of the equation, you know, we've, we've been learning and walking with the Lord, uh, 
you know, in different degrees, but for, the, for, for many of us, we don't have memory before that actually happened. So to, to think of someone who has this other idea of what Christian really means, and of course, C.S. Lewis was, I think, the first one who actually pointed this out, and at least the first one I'm aware of, and said that the word, that the label does not mean anything anymore. Right, yeah. So it's, it's yeah. interesting. Um, what are the opportunities out there for other creatives, no matter what their gift is or their genre or, or that they do, to really understand where the world is today and what their own opportunity is to affect it? So I, I think we should all answer this because all, all of our sets are so, all of our skill sets are so different. So let's go around. Say who you are before you answer for the yeah. people who can't see us. So. so I'm Corey Blankenship. I'm the one that they said it was almost a space marine. <laughs> technically, I'm a space operations staff officer. So I do have that. <laughs> so I am technically a space marine. I'm and you not, are a marine. I am. Sure. Yeah. So. And also a tank officer, which shows up in, sh in some of my stories. So I talk about things like giant robots that have the ability to fire. Like It's very militaristic, very much sci-fi fantasy where they're fighting. Uh, but I draw on those experiences to try to like captivate and bring people into, yeah, there's a lot of things that go on inside those vehicles that kind of get pushed to the side when people go, oh, those are cool tanks. You go, yeah, there's people inside that. So trying to bring that humanness to what's going on in those conflicts. Uh, but talking about opportunities for people that are creative, there are more than people realize. And a lot of it's just taking risks. One thing I love about Brandon is that he forces you to accept that, yes, I can try. And yes, you will try. And yes, you you may fail. But the thing is, you fail and then you learn and then you adjust and you keep on going. So that resiliency and that kind of, okay, what did we learn? Let's adjust and figure that out. So I think that there's something to be said about resiliency in the process of being creative. Super. I'm Brandon Hall. Um, and uh, like they they said, I am I'm the, the heart of the stories. A lot of the uh, collaborative writing that we've done. Um, and an amazing of, artist. <laughs> I do a lot of the yes. art on the backside of things. So <laughs> these guys have a lot more writing done and out there than I do. But if it's got a picture to it, chances are I've had a hand in it. But uh, layout, design, all sorts of stuff. Like that. I actually work for um, uh, for an advertising company for uh, for GMC. So it's I'm I love the art. I love the design. I love getting in there and, and getting hands digitally dirty, so to speak, mm -hmm. and uh, and putting stuff together. But um, uh, I love adding a heart to the characters, trying to, mm -hmm. to talk with these guys who build amazing character, you know, backgrounds and, you know, the situations that they go through, protagonist, antagonist, and, and every now and then, if need be, a lot of times it's not because these guys are great, but it's, it's a throw in of a little heart here. It, mm -hmm. That's great. They went down this direction. But what if they thought more this way and drew the reader in a little deeper into and brought it into the actual character's mindset? So little things like that. But um, one of the things I always love about Hall when we're collaborating and working on a project together is he will invariably there'll be a moment when everybody's excited about what's about to happen in the plot. <laughs> and he'll say, but what's your character feeling? And we're like, oh, shut up, Hall. <laughs> we don't care. We want to get to the action, you know. But but every time it makes us really step back and go, you know, we really do. We need to have a moment, you know, where we somehow express how is this character grappling with this emotionally or spiritually, you know. And so it really does. It, it gives a lot of depth and breadth to those characters. But mm -hmm. over to you, Davis, to answer the question. Uh, well, you know, and one thing that occurred to me, and of course, I'm Davis. A lot of Christians have bought into the world idea that we are not imaginative, that we're not creative, that somehow because we have to follow what they would call an itinerant Jewish rabbi, that we must be somehow backwards or ignorant or less understanding of the world. But if you really get into the scripture, I mean, good golly, if you read the Old Testament, you start discovering how things never change. I mean, they wear sandals, we wear boots, but it's not a lot of difference. Yeah. Then you start seeing, well, wait a minute. God, why would I limit God? Why would I limit God's gift? And if God can give me the gift of creativity, mm -hmm. why would I say, well, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm, I'm just a believer. I can't be creative. Then I'm saying my Lord isn't creative. And have you ever looked outside? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have been outside and been absolutely astonished at God's creation. I mean, there is no more creative entity in the universe yeah. than our Lord. And if he can be creative, 
then surely he has given us the gift to be creative as well. Surely he's allowed us to, to go out and then look at, evaluate, consider this world we are, come up with compelling characters and characters that are, that are compelling from the Christian worldview right. and they can be interesting and they can be compelling and they can have action and romance and, and joy and sadness because if you read the Bible, you find all of it. Well, and, and, and if you look at history, for hundreds and hundreds of years, it was the church that was the driving force in all of art, in all of science, you know, in all of these, um, in all these um, disciplines that we've kind of just checked the box on now as the church and co-opted to the world. And it, it's really one of our passions as a group and, and as individually to take back as much of that as we can individually, you know, and say, hey, no, you're not, you're not taking that from us, right? That's like David said, God made us to be creative creatures and to express ourselves creatively for his glory. And so if we're not doing that, in my opinion, we're not being good and obedient children. We're being disobedient. And that's not a good thing. So I agree with you. Uh, there's, there's two things that I really heard from you. One is that when you're in the presence of those who don't believe or those who believe something that is actually not what is. And we have, right. I think there are a lot of people in the faith community that believe things that really aren't the way they think they are. Mm -hmm. So I heard one thing that you said about the opportunity of connection that's mm -hmm. through the heart or it's through the action or it's through the space marine, whatever it is, <laughs> that these things find commonality with with people in other areas and that you create the connection that as Brandon Hollingsworth said, you know, the best gospel is the one that is preached silently that then encourages people to ask the question. But, but Brandon, you also just made a point that, that Davis brought up, which is anyone who has a creative gift we can, we can, you know, look at whatever the word is, but it is a talent. It is an ability. Yeah. And we know that so many people, in the, all of us, who of us, which of us does not look forward to the day that Jesus Christ says, well done, good and faithful servant. But Amen. when does he do that? Mm -hmm. Got to do something. Gentlemen, when does he do that? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think, I think you got to do something. And I think to go back to your earlier question, you know, I think, if there are creatives out there and they feel like they don't have a place, I would say now is the best time to be a Christian creative because with the advent of the internet, while it has its own, you know, foibles and, and pitfalls, you can, you can reach out and talk to so many people. You can get integrated with so many groups. And I can tell you, Lynn, over the past year, I have met so many Christian groups, people in Christian groups that are desperate for help. They, they need people who, who love to do art, who love to do editing, who love to do editing on videos, who love to do music. social media, music. I mean, every, I mean, and there, it's like there's an upswell of Christian creativity in the world right now. I really feel like God is calling out Christian creatives and there are plenty of opportunities. Now I will caution people and that make sure that whomever you're connecting to in terms of creativity, creatively connecting, make sure their theology and their doctrine are sound. Um, I had a great experience a couple of weeks ago. I was blessed to be able to talk to a Christian uh, a gaming company. They're making video games, Christian video games. Um, they're called Revelation Games. We can link to them in the show notes. And, and the first thing that I did, I got on a Zoom call with this guy and he said, tell me about your doctrine. He said, tell me about your theology. Who are your favorite preachers? He said, I have to vet you. He says, because there are a lot of people out there who claim to be Christian and they're really just weirdos that are co-opting the name of Christ. And so it's really critical if you're out there and you want to get connected to somebody, make sure that they believe the truth and that they're following the truth, that their orthopraxy is matching their orthodoxy. Because if they're not, walk away and call us. So, <laughs> and I think, I think it's biblical too, right? I mean, because we you read in the New Testament about the sorcerers mm -hmm. who were wanting to use this Christian doctrine yeah. that's the same thing we face today sure. right as christians as believers you know i'll call myself a christian but i really like the term believer better because it really states that it isn't it isn't just that i'm following this guy who 
apparently lived in the, the Middle East at some point in time. I am a believer in my Lord, right? Mm-hmm. No, I agree with that. I would say that the big thing there is understanding who you're working with, taking the time to get to know them, not just, hey, you have this entity, I see that you have a marketing brand, I see you have a deal, but what are you going to do with this? How is this actually going to further your kingdom work? Because it's very easy to throw things out there, especially right now. You have a great opportunity using independent publishers and things like that, where people can put whatever they want, whenever they want out there. Um, the biggest thing is knowing why you're doing it and then making sure that as you communicate that clearly, you demonstrate that with what you're doing. And, and that's another huge blessing of this group. Um, and it has been since the early days of us getting together is we will check each other. If we're working on something, you know, I can't, I can't even count the number of times I've called these men and said, Hey, I've got this crazy idea. Um, this is what it is. Am I too far off base? Like, am I too outside the realm of scripture or, mm-hmm. you know, am I doing something that's heretical? And if you have brothers and if you have sisters that you can reach out to that are, that are learned in the word, right. And they're praying, right. And they can go, you know, Brandon, that, that's a great idea, but it's probably not scriptural. So you might mm-hmm. want to, you know, kind of restructure it or back off on that. Let it simmer for a while, pray about that, you know, whatever that is, that is a critical component of this group that uh, I wouldn't trade for anything. Well, let me, let me ask you a question about that because you said you have uh, at least one member in your press mm-hmm. who is not a believer. That's so right. how does that work then in the group collaborating? If, if one is required to check doctrine mm-hmm. and make sure that nothing untoward is going out, when you know that you have someone else that doesn't even believe. Yeah. He has to sit through all the meetings and hear it all. So, and, and if, and if he doesn't like it, that's fine, but he has to, he's part of the group. So he has to sit there and go through it all. And honestly, I think part of that's been, you know, a little bit of softening, you know, is, is occurring there, you know, because he does, when, when you spend time on something and people see you spending time on something, like I could be watching the TV or I could be out golfing or whatever people do in their free time, but no, I'm going to sit here for an hour or two and I'm going to talk about how doctrine affects this crazy idea about Russian eight men in space. That, that imputes a value, right? I've spent three hours talking about this topic, which means it means something to me. For someone who's not a believer, that's, that can be pretty powerful because oftentimes people who aren't believers, and I know me when I was a non-believer, you know, I just, I kind of, I was captured by whatever came along, you know, whatever that came along captured my fancy and so when you see people really grappling with these concepts, it imputes a very powerful value to them. There's something else that I was hearing, you know, we, I mentioned, you know, well done, good and faithful servant, which is multiplying talents. Right. It's giving a return on the investment, whatever gift God has placed in you or talent or ability. You know, we know that the Lord is gratified He's, he's blessed when, and we are rewarded. And it's very clear when we multiply that. So looking at your collaborative um, effort and the way that y'all are bonded and help one another, it sounds like you get a multiplication effect that, and I would love to hear you speak directly to the person listening who is either a writer who is afraid to work with someone else or an author who's afraid to work with someone else, or even if it's me, I, I do most of my work on my own, but I'm concerned about letting someone else do some of the stuff on my website because I'm accountable for every single word and nuance. So could you, could you speak to those people who, you know, man, there's, there may be a perfect opportunity for them to multiply, but they have a concern. I'll talk to that, Brandon. Yeah, sure. So a big thing with that is going in and saying, who are you? Knowing the person you're talking with, knowing what they write, knowing how they write. I think the biggest advantage we have here is that we know each other outside of writing. And so mm-hmm. that relationship founded the trust that we could go and say, I know your point of view is going to be different, but I know it's not going to be hostile to what I'm doing. And so what you're talking about there, being accountable for what's on your site but it's also knowing who's coming into your community and saying, I've spent time with you. I've talked with you. 
and I trust you. And I think that trust right there is what builds that collaboration because it's not me competing with Brandon. Right. It's me enabling Brandon to write the stories he's writing. That sounds so familiar. It sounds like the mo- like the model of membership, church membership. I was going to say, and let's not, let's not leave this to the human component alone. Right. We have to accept there's also the spirit. Mm-hmm. And you know, I can tell you there's nothing more edifying than finding myself in a conversation with my brothers um, just the spiritual con- conversation, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And you just feel it, right? Mm-hmm. And so while well, you, you do have to vet and you do, you do have to be careful who you invite into your company, but we also have to say we are saved and we do have the spirit. And mm-hmm. at some point, you know, it's not, how about we, you pray? How about you say, hey, spirit, is this a right fit? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, I, I solidly believe the spirit will speak to us. Oh yeah. And will. he does. Yeah, we've had, and we have experiences where we can up. talk about that. Absolutely. So <laughs> and the, there's, there's the practical element of this as well, Lynn, in that, you know, I, and I'm not disagreeing with what either of these guys said, agree a thousand percent, but there's also a practical in that. And we have found solidly time and time again, that four or more brains are always better than one, you know, mm-hmm. um, like when we were collaborating on our first mosaic novel, which was not a four fools thing. We did that, you know, for another company, but the story that we wound up writing was so much better Mm -hmm. after we all worked on that together and kind of strove with one another and strove with those tales better. I mean, with one another, it it came out, the end product was so much better than any one person could have produced alone. And you have, you have, you know, four or more sets of eyes that are checking everything that you do. You know, like we have an editorial process that we go through, a proofreading process, a final check process, and having, you know, more sets of eyes and more brains attached to those eyes really helps catch any errors or any issues that might crop up. And I can't tell you how much I've learned about Photoshop from this guy, (laughs) having someone in your group with other talents, Mm -hmm. right, that you can kind of rub up against and learn and kind of expand your skill set is is another kind of fringe benefit of this sort of arrangement and because we don't we don't keep each other in a swim lane you know it's not Mm -hmm. it's not like davis can only do historical editing Mm -hmm. you know we might pull him in on a project you know for russian eight men from space which did have a historical element but it kind of went off from there so (laughs) so as we as we get into our last couple of minutes um i would love to so i understand that one of the reason this works is because you knew each other before you got together. Your motivation initially was not, we want to write better books, make more money, be more successful. So we're going to find people who complement our skills. So, so that not, wasn't it. So, no, not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think that speaks, um, Davis, to what you were saying about the spirit that brought you together There's two things I'd love to cover for the audience. One is for each one of you, the motivation and how you almost, if if this is the right terminology, receive the call to do what you do creatively. And and then just in case my mind goes into space with the ape men, uh, (laughs) I want to finish, I want to finish up with a little bit about how this actually works as a group and a business uh, with copyrights and different things like that. So if you could just, if each one of you could tell our listeners that when you knew and how you knew that, that serving the Lord in this way was something that he had for you. All right. Who wants to go first? I'm uh, Brennan Hall here. And uh, I, when I'm, when I was in high school, I actually stumbled around with a lot of, with a lot of, um, and things that I, you know, that I may not, it was, a, it was a curiosity or an interest, but yet I had a very close friend that stepped in and said, whoa, 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 before you step into that, you need to make sure that your armor is on properly. And he, that's, that right there stuck with me. And when I stepped into a lot of the things or just looked at them and went, you know you, what? You can tell I'm them done. You, 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 know, you can tell them you're dabbling with the occult. That's fine. Yeah, I was very curious about the Necronomicon. Yeah. I'd heard a lot of folks talk about the Necronomicon. I'd read the Bible from front to back. I, I was raised in a very Christian family. We were in church every single Sunday. 
I went to um, you know, uh, private schools for the first four or five years of my life. So it's, I was very, very deep into a church family. And I figured if, if I know the Bible, quote unquote, know the Bible frontwards and backwards, then I can step in and read something like the Necronomicon and study over here with this other to see what everyone's talking about. And a friend of mine stepped in and, and, and literally walked me through making sure that everything was right where it needed to be before I did that. Someone who cared deeply for me. I sat down that night and I thought through it. I prayed probably the hardest I have ever prayed in my entire life was right then and there about, I need the direction. I need the strength. I need to know if I'm doing this properly, should I be doing this? And I stopped and I said, you know what? I can't recall when I gave literally gave my voice to the Lord and said, please forgive me for all the sin that I have done my entire life. Please wash over me and bring me into your fold and, and love me and forgive me. And that night next to my bed, I, I, I gave every bit I could and I stopped. I didn't say amen at the end of it because I wanted to leave that dialogue open. <laughs> I wanted to lay down and I wanted God to go, come here, boy. <laughs> but I wanted, I, I really wanted to, to find a peace in my heart. And I had not done that prior to this. When I woke up the next morning, there is no possible way to describe the feeling of someone who thinks they're saved mm -hmm. and then becomes saved. Mm -hmm. It's something you have to experience. And I, of course, recommend everybody experience that because it's, it's, it's the greatest feeling of my life. Yeah, it's a whole new world. It is yeah. a complete new world. That right there really opened me up to a lot of the, the emotion, the heart, the feeling, the, the awareness of, of a lot of the friends that I had at that point in time. And that allowed me to, to walk better in his path and the do the things that I have done leading me to these gentlemen. And in all honesty, not necessarily just following God, following his footprints that took me to working at QZAR, meeting this guy, meeting this guy, meeting this guy. <laughs> so it's, it's something that I, I, I highly, highly recommend that, that you sit back and you think about who you are, where you come from. Take that to the Lord. Talk with him often. And, and, and allow him to talk to you and listen. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing. Listen to what he says to you. Yeah. And that right there has kind of been my, it, that was, that was my, my, my link into the passion that has become what I do with you know, writing the heart of a lot of the characters or adding a little spark here and there. But a lot of that came from that spark that I had that night, and it has transformed everything I've done since then. Wow. Thank you, Brandon Hall. Corey. Yes, Lynn. So the word that's missing is providence. I think that's what we've been trying to talk about. That's what keeps coming up. Yeah. And I would yeah. say that God has been very, very intentional in these conversations in our lives and how we interact with each other. So for me, Brandon came into my life like a wrecking ball. I smashed into my preconceptions on how to do life. Uh, a lot of it was starving for that community, starving for that opportunity to voice what seemed to be very strange thoughts, uh, just because most people go, all right, this is how we do life. And this is the only way to do it. You come in on Sunday, you do these songs, you hear these words. Uh, but I knew because of the spirit of God and knew from scripture, like that can't just be it. There's too much in this word. There's too many things happening. These people have enlivening experiences from being at the top of the food chain all the way down to the bottom. I said, God cannot be just one way. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has such a unique range of people and cultures throughout just scripture alone. And you go, wait, scripture goes on and talks about the communities that are today. And so like the history that we run into, what Davis talks about a lot is how God is persistent. And so talking with Brandon and having those conversations, getting invited to his house by his son, uh, I was just brought into a friendship that said, hey, God is very, very vast and he's very, very creative. How about we interact and dialogue and discuss that unashamedly? Mm -hmm. And so that Providence opportunity of getting to sit down at his table and learn from them as a friend uh, kind of just invited me into their 
their crazy creative life, which is what became Four Fools. We talk about it and we just do that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Corey Davis. Mm -hmm. Well, mine's a, an interesting beginning. Um, I I've, I've, was a believer for a very long time, but I remember the first time I actually put my faith in the Lord, true faith. And here's, here's where it gets weird. Friday the 13th was being filmed in my town. <laughs> and I found myself in an abandoned camp in an empty cabin and suddenly afraid. Now that, that's not, that's a real story. And I remember the Lord speaking to me and it wasn't the literal words, but it was that I am with you. And I realized the Lord's with me. And that got me, that, that gave me the, the, I started being more creative with what I wanted to write. And so I started writing and, and he told me, when you write, don't be antagonistic to me. In other words, my first writing wasn't Christian writing as long as it wasn't anti-God. But then, you know, you ever, as a Christian, you ever feel like you're being lukewarm? You feel like maybe you're not really going that extra step? And then, and, and then I got, I remember one time, this, this thought came to my head, if you're not ashamed of me, then write of me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I started doing it. And I started really getting into the more overtly Christian literature, overtly unapologetic, A, of faith, B, of, of who we worship, and C, of his power. You know how often we walk around pretending that we believe, but that he's somewhere else. Whereas it's here, it's this physical desk, it's this physical room. The Lord's with us right now, mm -hmm. and the Spirit's with us right now. Mm -hmm. And it was that Spirit moving, and I can't say I had some great conversion moment, but I can say it has been more evolutionary that as I do something, and the Lord's like, well, really, is that enough? And then I do another thing, and the Lord's like, okay, is that enough? And it's like, I keep feeling like I need to keep doing more, so I become more more overtly Christian with my literature. So the point that I am now, I'm totally willing to write a complete, a completely Christian based story that is an advocate of our faith and our Lord. Yep. That's great. It's, it's interesting how you, you have such different paths to getting here. Brandon Hollingsworth. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to answer your question. First of all, I want to, I want to point out one really neat connection, Lynn, before I do that. Corey talked about being invited in to come and sit at my table and kind of feel that um, that welcomingness, right? And that belonging. Mm -hmm. There's a really interesting connection here. I want to point it out in that my childhood was pretty rough and my parents were not the best parents at all. And when I met Davis in the 10th grade, his parents invited me into their home and created this wonderful um, welcoming, warm, accepting kind of little bubble um, that I got to experience as a young man in high school. And I always told myself that if I ever have a place of my own, and if I ever have a home, I want to, I want it to feel like Davis's mom and dad's house felt. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a lineage here. And I praise God for that lineage. Mm -hmm. um, we, we call it the Rivendell effect because in, in J.R.R. Tolkien, um, Bilbo talks about Rivendell and how it's a wonderful place to work or for song or for writing or for, for eating or for drinking. And that is the, that's the sensation that I had when I went to Davis's home as a young man. And that's the sensation that I like to try and, and exude, have my home exude for others. And so um, there's a really cool kind of connection there. And it's not just Corey, there's been other people as well, but who are also uh, have done creative stuff with us too. But anyway, now on to your question. So for me, uh, I, I was published actually before I was saved. I, I wasn't saved until I was 33 years old. Um, so I was, you know, obviously an adult married with, with children. And I had gotten published in the role playing game industry. Um, I had known a lot about, uh, about the Bible. I didn't really grow up in church, but I had, I had learned and read a lot. Um, in, in my own search for the truth, but had not yet bent the knee and had not yet been obedient to my Lord. Um, but when I was 33 and I was saved, everything kind of changed for me. And I began, I began realizing that, hey, there are things that I used to do that I don't need to do anymore, right? There, I, like for me, I love horror movies. I'm a huge horror movie fan. But, you know, after I was saved, God began through the Holy Spirit to convict me of those things and say, hey, some of this stuff you shouldn't be watching. It doesn't glorify me, right? It actually, 
is antagonistic towards me, to use a phrase that Davis mentioned. And so uh, I just began slowly, you know, uh, daily kind of sacrificing those things and giving those things out and saying, I'm not going to do this if it doesn't glorify you. If it doesn't make you happy, Father, I don't want it a part of my life. And he convicted me and said, you know, that means you're writing too. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What are you talking about? That's mine. And he was like, no, it's really not yours. I gave you that. And so from that point on, I'm like, okay, I got it. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to keep on writing, but I want to do it to glorify you. And so, um, you know, here we are. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate that. Let's go to the last thing I just really want to cover for our listeners, because it's something that, you know, it is practical. And that is there Mm -hmm. are four to seven, I don't know how many there are in your press right now. Right, right. Okay. It's, uh, uh, so four, five, seven, six. Six, six. Okay, so there are six. Oh yeah, seven, it's seven, seven. sorry. So how do you handle things like sure. copyright, royalties, um, sure. you know, crediting, author accounts, you know, how do you, how do you manage the mechanics of business sure. collaboration? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So one thing that, that since we're all, for the most part, brothers in Christ or people that we trust, um, we just basically have single accounts. Like, so everything is all one email account and pretty much one password that we can log into for each site that we're on, whether it be Google Play or Amazon Press. So there's complete transparency. At any point, anybody can log in and see any email. They can see any sales report. You know, nothing is hidden from anyone. Um, when we do the work, when someone comes and pitches a product and say, Hey, I got a new idea for a book. I want to write it. Then we have a certain set of uh, things. And I can actually send you kind of the spreadsheet over to show you the stages where we kind of, we have to have essentially, you know, kind of initial proofing. We have to have, you know, someone assigned to be your alpha reader. Someone's assigned to be your beta reader. After that, once it passes those kind of gates, those check marks, Um, It then moves into editing. Uh, It then moves into second stage editing. At that point, we generally start working. At that point, we know if it's going to be a good story. So we're working on cover. We're working on marketing cover, you know, copy cover for the back cover text or the website or whatever. Um, And then there's a final layout and then a publishing. And so everybody um, in the group signs up for one of those tasks. And if all the tasks don't have a name by them, then we don't start the project. So everybody gets on board at some level. You can have more than one job if you want, but if you sign up for a job, you have to do it. And the number of jobs that you do determines your cut of the profits. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to work more and you make more on the profits, and then when the profits come out, everybody can see what sales are and everybody keeps their own characters, their own copyrights. So nobody makes any claims. Like if Davis has characters, I don't claim that. I have characters that people don't claim that. Um, and so everybody keeps their own copyright. We split out the royalties when we get them, uh, based on those percentages and everybody can see where everything is going. So it's, uh, it's a nightmare to keep up with, but it's, uh, it's all transparent it's effective. and it's worth it. It's, it's worth the nightmare to, to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Mm-hmm. So. Well, thank you for that. I think we're going to get to a close here. So I just want to give everybody here a thank you, gentlemen. I so appreciate your time and the fact that you're so willing to share with the audience. In a final thought, you know, just just on the other side of the green light there at the top of of the screen or whatever it is that you guys are looking at, Mm -hmm. there could be someone who just needs to hear a word about where they are where their gift is, where their walk with the Lord is. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna position it any, any particular way. I just would like, because uh, you know, as Davis said earlier, a lot of this is, if not most of this is Holy Spirit led. If each one of you would just share a final thought for the listeners that's out there. Sure, you wanna go first, Paul? Don't give up, mm-hmm. ever. Don't stop. You may have folks throw stuff in your path. You may stumble. You may fall. There may be one set of footprints, and you're trying to figure out where God's footprints are. Those are his. He's carrying you. (laughs) Do not give up. There are a lot of roadblocks that you'll hit, 
but it's worth the individuals that you find and it's worth the glorification to God of the stuff that you are putting together and, and, and putting out into the world with his name on it. Amen. So, so do not give up, do not stop ever. Brandon Hall. Thank you very much. We'll just kind of go to the back again, Corey Blankenship. Yeah. What I'd also add to that is seek community. Don't do it alone. You're not alone. That's a big thing that very easily gets said in people's hearts is that I'm doing this on my own. Cause like writing, like you said, is a very individualistic approach. What I love is that these brothers come in and break that down. I think that that is something that can be replicated because it's not something that we've created in secret. It's not something that we've branded on our own. We can't copyright that. God loves community. His spirit moves in community Amen. and he teaches and trains us in community. So if you want to write, if you want to create, if you want to draw, find a friend, find a mentor and be persistent in that. Build those relationships. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Corey. Man, I feel like I'm having church. Davis, Davis Riddle. <laughs> I would agree to what they both said. Um, and <clears throat> just to name drop, I went to the same college as John Grisham. And he was actually a, a bit of a mentor for me on some of my early writing. And one of the things he said is, you're going to get rejected. And you're going to get rejected again. And you're going to get rejected again. Now, that goes back to what Paul said is you can't give up, right? You look at Isaiah. You look at, at so many other prophets who who faced that rejection, and they weren't even sure that what they were doing was even going to get seen, right? And so you have to accept that if you're a Christian, and you're, if you're a creative Christian, and you believe that the Lord has given you this gift, and you believe that it's important to use your gift, then you use that gift. You're going to polish it. Your early stuff's not going to be very good, mm -hmm. but that's fine, because that's how you grow. Paul did not start preaching until he spent two years in the desert, mm -hmm. and then he came out. And, and the, to all creative people, if you're starting on that journey— Go ahead and do your desert time. Work it. Don't give up. Because if you're doing it for the Lord, then giving up means you're giving up on something the Lord gave you. And he's going to ask, what about your gift? Mm -hmm. So don't give up. And then if you, if you face the criticism of the world, then embrace it. Say, hey, you know what? I'm glad you didn't like it. You don't, you, if you're against the Christian, good, you're against me. But, you, but I'm going to do it for the Lord, and I will not apologize. Yeah. And be willing to go bold, and don't give up. And if you do that, the Lord will use you. And he may not use you to get super rich. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's only one person out there mm -hmm. who hears or reads what you did. But how do you know that 80 years from now, that one person's grandson doesn't become one of the great evangelists of the 23rd century? Yeah, absolutely. You, you don't know. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how the Lord works. We just have to know that if the Lord puts us there, he has his purpose. And all we need to do is the tool that he wants to use. Amen. Desert time sounds like a great idea for a devotional book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Davis. Brandon Hollingsworth. Uh, I would say um, what all the angels always said every time they showed up, do not fear. I think fear is the creativity killer. I think that there are so many Christian creatives out there and they are so afraid of something, fill in the blank. Maybe it's rejection. Maybe it's judgment. Maybe it's mockery or scorn or in our crazy world we live in today, maybe it's getting canceled. Well, who cares, right? God's made you to write. He's made you to be an eloquent speaker. He's made you to play music. He's made you to compose beautiful artistry or sculpt things or be a blacksmith or whatever. All of these wonderful gifts God has given us. And the only job you have is to use that to the best of your ability and glorify your king. So that when people come and say, wow, what inspired you to paint that? Or how did you make that amazing wrought iron tree? Or, you know, that, that song moved me so much. What inspired you to do that? You can say, Jesus. Easy answer. I think you guys have, have just really brought a lot to the table. And it's certainly a different kind of an interview. And as, as you were talking about music and just mentioning that in your list, Brandon, I was thinking, you know, you can have an artist who writes a song mm -hmm. and it becomes, you know, notes on a clef on a page and maybe they sing it a cappella or maybe they add a guitar, but imagine your song being played by an orchestra. Mm -hmm. And, and that's really, I think, a vision of what y'all shared with the audience today. And I just wanna thank you. Uh, 
For those who are listening, there's going to be show notes, ways you can connect with each one of the four fools who are with us today, even though they didn't tell us why they're fools. We'll have to catch that the next <laughs> time. But thank you so much for being with us today. This is Lynn Baber. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening today. To see the resources mentioned in today's episode, you can head over to theophanymedia.com forward slash fools. But before you do, please rate and review. Creatively Christian is a product of Theophany Media. You can find out more at theophanymedia.com. This show is hosted by Brandon Hollingsworth, Andrea Sandifer, Bill Brooks, and Lynn Baber. Our logo is by Bill Brooks. Our music is by Bill Brooks and Andrea Sandifer. And remember, if you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to rate, review, and share wherever you listen to podcasts. Have a blessed day and keep on creating for our Lord.